Well, time to move into the, to the message today. As I said earlier, this is Palm Sunday, and a lot of churches will highlight Palm Sunday. But I'm going to take a different tact. I'm going to move into the reason why we need this week before, and, and what's the significance of Good Friday and Easter. We're going to talk about that, of course, on those two days. But this is kind of the lead-in. Um, I, I, we need to understand the reason why we're here, why we, we do the celebration, why we remember this, and, and what really caused this to happen. So Romans chapter 6 will be our text today. We'll get to that in just a minute. Here's the main thought for the day. It's this. Following Jesus means that we have died to sin in order to live in the freedom of his salvation. That's what it means. Following Jesus means we have died to sin in order to live in the freedom of his salvation. Why? Because we are called to put sin to death. Now Jesus did the work of putting sin to death, but then we also, need, we, we also have a role to play in that in our own personal lives. And so we're going to look at that today. So the title of today's message is Putting Sin to Death. And, and really what we need to understand is that we died to sin. The day you said yes to Jesus and you give your life to him, sin is supposed to have a cardiac arrest. Not you. You're not supposed to have the cardiac arrest. The sin that was in you was, is supposed to die. It's supposed to have the heart attack. It's supposed to go away. And so, you know, but the thing is, we're human. And I, I can't diminish the fact that we're, we, are, we're, we still have a role to play. And this is why I, I like to say this phrase, you hear a lot of people will say this phrase, we're free moral agents. All the Calvinists in the room are, are losing their marbles when I say that. Fact of the matter is, you are free to make your own choice. Scripture is very, very clear on that, that you are responsible for you. You're not getting saved because of Sean. You're not getting saved because of the band. You're not getting saved because of your mom. You're not getting saved because your, church, your, your family goes to church. You're not getting saved because you're a member at a church. That's, that's, you're not getting redemption because of anything else. You have to make the choice. And so following Jesus means we've died in order to live in the freedom of his salvation. And, and Holy Week is all about salvation. Finally, the promised salvation that Adam and Eve longed for. You remember the story of Adam and Eve, how they, they sinned against the Lord and rebelled, and it caused everything to, to be turned upside down. And they were promised that one day, a Savior would come and, and crush the, enemy, uh, the enemy's head. And that day was when Jesus showed up on the scene. And so, let's look at the text, and we'll get right to it. Romans chapter 6. We're starting at verse 11. We're going to also jump over a couple of, of verses, not because I'm trying to leave it out, just for time's sake. Um, so we're going to do six to, chapter 6, 11 to 14, and verses 22 and 23. Starting at verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves uh, to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but you are now under grace. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. There's a lot of good stuff there. So we're going to go jump back up to verse 11. Thank you. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Now, if you have time to read this, this part of, of this chapter to, or the whole chapter, what Paul's talking about, is explaining what, that, that sin no longer has to own you. That when you come to Jesus, sin doesn't own you. You say, but I struggle a lot with sin. Struggling with sin is not the same as being owned by sin. Before you knew Jesus, your whole identity was summarized in the fact that you were a creature destined for eternal destruction. Because all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. What is sin? Now, I mentioned this last week, but sin is this. It's not a mistake. Sin is a state of being. And sin is stuff that we, we commit against God in violation of his commands and expectations for his creation. 
And so whether you like it or you don't like it, that's not my problem. You and I are created. He is the creator. We answer to him. He does not answer to us. Yet I see a lot of Christians and a lot of churches a lot of times, oftentimes have that in, in the wrong order. And they think that God answers to their whims and their needs and their desires. Their favorite verses, but they don't like the sticky verses. You either accept all of God's word or you can't accept any of it. God isn't just love. God is also just. And if God is just and righteous and holy, sin must be dealt with. And therefore, his creation violates it. They must be punished. But isn't it great that he loves his creation so much that he said, no, 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 that's got to end. I will send at just the right time the Redeemer to break that bond. And that's what this is all about. And so, when, when we, Paul's talking about this, he says, in the same way, when you, you've got to count yourselves dead to sin. I like the term count. I should have highlighted that as well. You need to get into the mindset or count yourself dead to sin. When you accept Christ, you're saying, I am going to die to anything that is in violation of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. I'm not going to walk with one foot in the world and one foot in, the, in, in God. I'm going to walk completely with the Lord. I'm not going to walk with Him. And here's a couple of cautions for you. Scripture is very, very clear. Jesus said, there will be those who come to me and said, didn't I drive out demons? Didn't I heal the sick for you? And he'll say, depart from me. I never even knew you. Because they hadn't given their heart to him. There's power in the name of Jesus. You could proclaim Jesus and, people, and, and freedom will happen. But I can tell you this much, that if your heart is not fully locked into Jesus, he doesn't even know you. He wants all of you, or he doesn't want any of you. Church, give everything you have to him. Give your ugly side. Give, your, you know, give, give, give him your, your morning when you wake up your bedside. Give him that. And then give him you know, your, your wedding day side. Give him and everything in between. Give him everything about you or, or you're just spinning your wheels. And so we see that here. Paul is saying, count yourselves dead. Like get into the headspace. You're dead to sin. Sin is dead to you. You don't want to go in and live in a moral lifestyle anymore. You don't want to, to be a liar anymore. You don't want to be causing divisions anymore. You don't want to be prideful and arrogant anymore. You don't want to think that you're on top and everybody else is below, even if you don't say it out loud. We all do it. We think from time to time, they're not as good as I am. How do I know that? Because gossip comes from that very spirit. And gossip destroys relationship. So, he's saying, count yourselves. That old system is dead. Why? Because the but is right there. The one T but. The important one. But, when you're dead to sin, you're now instead, you're alive to God. Is there anybody in the house that is alive to God today? <laughs> All right. Give me a witness. That's awesome. So, we're alive to God through Christ Jesus. We're not alive to God on our own, and that's what he's saying here. You're alive to God in Jesus. So that song we just sang this morning, I Speak Jesus, there's that power in his name. We're alive to God because of Jesus and through Jesus, because he is the, the savior of our lives. And so in verse 12, we, he goes on and explains it a bit further. He says, therefore, with all that in mind, don't let sin reign. But Sean, didn't you say we're, we're set free from sin? We are. But sin doesn't stop. Sin is like weeds. Hey, who, is here, who here has ever planted a garden? Do you plant a garden and never weed it? It makes for one sad sack garden if you don't weed it. I've been, you know, I've been to gardens where they had let it go, something happened, and they weren't able to tend it that year, and you can't tell where the, where the vegetables are and, or the fruits are and where the, you know, all the, the weeds are because the, the weeds just kind of overgrow it like trees and they're just little bushes underneath. And that's kind of like what sin does in our life. If we don't deal with it, if we don't constantly stay vigilant, we, we get into those problems. So he says, don't let sin reign in your body. Mortal body. Not your spirit, your body. Hey, the, the, the body wants to do what the body wants to do. When somebody gets you mad, you want to lash out. When, when you see something that somebody else has and you kind of want it, you start to covet. You know, when... You know, you get weak and stressed and then full of anxiousness, you might start to say or think things that you know are not, are not righteous. Maybe you withdraw from the Lord, and, and so you start to do, do actions 
that, that are, are counter to the word of God. And so he says, don't let sin reign. Don't let it be your God. Don't let it be your king. Don't let it be the supreme thing in your life. Do not let sin in. Don't give it a foothold. And so this is important that we understand. We're set free from the power of sin, but the actions of sin are still floating around there. They're like weeds in the garden. You plant this big, beautiful garden, you get all the rows, you put your little strings, you get all the mounds up, right? You put your fertilizer in there, you get some water, you, you put all the, you measure it all up, you get all the seeds in right, maybe you get your little saplings that you pre-grew, you get them all in place, and you step back and you go, all right, this looks good. And then you decide not to, to, uh, to weed it. And a week goes by, and there's a little weed there, a little wheat there, not so bad. You know, three weeks later, they're a little bigger, but the vegetables are bigger too. They're starting to come up. They're going really good. You're like, ah, they'll be fine. Six weeks later, where are the vegetables again? Because the weeds overtake it. And sin is like weeds in your life. It will overtake the righteousness that you've planted and that God has planted in you, and it will completely choke you out. And it can actually kill you eventually. It can actually cause a reversal because you, you, you're moving away from it. You're not dealing with it. We're in a relationship with the Most High God through Jesus Christ. Don't choke out the relationship by letting the weeds of sin come back in. Don't let it rain so that you obey its evil desires. See what happens? You go from being set free, or you obey God, and eventually you let those, those sin weeds grow, and you start to obey them instead of the Lord. And this is where a lot of our struggles with sin come from, because we, we, we get sloppy and we allow it to get in. You need to be in the Word daily. You need to be in prayer on, a, on, a, on, on the, almost on the hourly. And like I said, prayer doesn't have to be like this in a quiet room. Prayer could be in the middle of your job, just taking a couple of moments and say, Lord, I really need your help here. I'm struggling, I'm feeling the stress, or I'm, this person's on, on me, and I just, I just feel it coming on. I need you to, to work with me. And you talk to the Lord about it. It's amazing when you start to commit things to the Lord, how those things get weaker. It's called spiritual weeding. When you bring the things that you know um, to, to God that you know that sh you shouldn't have in your life, it's like the gardener plucking out the weeds and throwing them in the fire. And you keep those, those rows clear and, and, and your fruit and your vegetables grow clean. Your life starts to grow clean and you start to, to see progress in your life. And so don't let sin rain your body. In verse 13, there's a lot here, so I'm going to move along quickly. He says, do not offer any part. If there's one thing that progressive Christianity is guilty of, it's still staying stuck in some of the mindsets of the world, of the flesh. And he says, don't offer any part of yourself to sin because it becomes like an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. So there's always a trade-off. You've got two choices. You can either offer yourself to God or you can offer yourselves to sin. And you say, well, why do I struggle with sin? Because you're offering yourself to it. It feels good to get angry. It, it feels validating to justify the bad words you said about somebody. To take something that doesn't belong to you. Because your flesh is weak. Remember? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you need to understand that your flesh is as, uh, a, a big a temptation in your life as what, what the spiritual forces are in our world. Because you, you can't leave this body. You don't get a second one until you get to eternity. So you're going to have to learn to manage this thing until God calls you home. And so that's why I say, don't offer yourselves to wickedness. Don't offer it as an instrument. Don't sing the, the, the praises of sinfulness by your actions. Don't glamorize certain artists, certain politicians, certain movie stars, certain people in your life. Don't, don't glamorize them when you know they're doing things that are wrong or saying things that are wrong. Don't glamorize. Glamorize Jesus. It is amazing when you put Jesus front and center in your life, how everything else just pales in comparison to the amazing nature of Jesus in our lives. And so he, said, he continues on. He says, as those who have been brought from death to life. Notice it, it didn't, when we talk about dealing with sin, it's not that you went from death to life. He brought you from death to life. The bridge from death which is what we are celebrating this coming week, is death to sin. Sin has brought death. From that sin death, Jesus brings you to life. You can't do it on your own. Salvation is only found in Jesus. You can't be good enough. You can't buy your way there. You can't look pretty enough. 
You can't look handsome enough. You can't be strong enough. You can't be smart enough. In fact, Jesus and the work of the cross causes smart people to get very frustrated. You notice that in our world? There's a lot of smart people that, that are opposed to the word of God. Why is that? Because it, 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 it's illogical in the sense of that we need somebody to, to save us. And yet, they struggle with sins and they struggle with, with the blindness of this life. And they struggle with it, but yet it's so simplistic that even a child can understand salvation. It's when we start to, to put our intellect in, in the way of the word of God that we don't understand it. This is why I'm saying smart people should be the first ones on the boat to, to, to the Lord, and yet they're the ones that seem to struggle the most. And yet little children, you don't have to tell a child very much about Jesus before they go, I, I want to know Jesus. If you ever, I used, we used to do VBSs, and, and I did youth ministry for, for decades, and I loved doing it. You know why? Because you don't have to tell them very much. They get it even before you explain it. They're like, oh, I, I want to know Jesus. I, I, I like Jesus. I, I, I want to be like him. T can you, where is he? I want to go see him. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if adults started thinking that way? Instead of letting all of the, the things of this world and the flesh get in the way, he said, no, no, I, I want to know Jesus. And so that's what he's saying. He brings you from death to life and, and you, so that you can offer, offer, in other words, you freely give. Do you see that, that, that you are free to give? The free moral agent is throughout Scripture. You must offer every part of yourself to him. Notice he didn't say, you didn't just offer him, you know, some of the parts. You can just offer, you know, the, the really bad ones. And you'll keep a few of the not so bad ones. Or you only offer the really, the really good parts. No, you, you need to offer every part of yourself to him. So that every part of you be, starts to become righteous. And that's important, that if we're going to put sin to death, that we have to offer it. God's not going to force you to do it. You're either going to do it on your, your own, by, by your own free will, say, God, take me and, and make me what you need me to do. Take away anything in my life that isn't, isn't glorifying you, isn't honoring you, and, and make me more to look like you each and every day. Or you're not. And that's dangerous. I, I feel very sad for those who, who go to church, and I'm not saying this church, I'm just saying church in general, who who have Christian principles and ideals, yet they live like the devil throughout the week. They're not going to see heaven unless they repent. It's just not going to happen. Repentance means I cast off sin in my life. It is my enemy, and I hate it, and I want only the righteousness of God, and yet this is where we struggle with. And so why is, why is the cross so vital? Because without it, we're, we're hopeless. Everything is lost. Even on your best day, it's, it will pale in comparison to what Jesus will do in your life. We have to give it all to him. So, in verse 14, he, he goes on and he says, sin will no longer be your master. You see, I, I, this is, and this, when somebody says, I can't overcome it, it's because you don't believe that God can overcome it in you. You, you, have, to, you have to throw those things off. This is why we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. It takes faith for salvation. And he says, sin will no longer be your master. And I know so many people, and I've struggled with this when I was early on in trying to learn how to, how to be a, be, live righteously for the Lord. You know, sin will no longer be your master. Oh, I can't, I can't get over this. Yes, you can. Because God's already broken its power. You're choosing to, to, to nurture it. You're not weeding that area of your garden. And you've got to let it out. And so he says, if you, if you do these things, if you offer all of yourself to him, you're no longer, sin's no, no longer going to be your master. It doesn't mean it won't tempt you. It doesn't mean it won't come up against you. Or somebody else's sin will come up against you as well. That happens. But it's not going to master you. It won't own you. Because when you start feeling the pressure of that sin coming at you, you're going to, you're going to uh, press into the Holy Spirit. You're going to press into the truth of God's word. You're going to press into your Savior. And he is going to teach you and lead you until you overcome it. There's nothing wrong with struggling with sin. Struggle against it is a good thing. That's called temptation. Did you know that Jesus went through lots of temptation? 40 days worth of it. While he didn't eat. Most of us are a bear after missing one meal. Could you imagine? 40 days of not eating and having the devil chirping in your ear all that time? He knows what it's like to be tempted. 
Temptation is not the problem. It's what you do with the temptation that comes at you. And so even when you go to, to psychology and psychologists and counselors, one of the things that they'll try to teach you is that, you know, just because you have an urge doesn't mean you have to act on the urge. And so they try to discover what causes the urge. And that can be some, of some benefit. But make no mistake, the real cause of all the urges we have is our flesh. And then when you couple that with the, with the powers of, of, of uh, spirits and devils and demons and everything else that go along that we can't see, it, it creates, you know, it can sometimes create a tidal wave of things that come at us. So that's why we've got to be alert. We've got to keep the, that spiritual garden weeded so that we can overcome these things. And so he says, sin will no longer be your master. Why? Because you're not under the law anymore. You're under grace. Grace is actually a little bit harder than the law. Some people disagree with me. You can disagree if you'd like. I find that grace sometimes is harder than the law. Because the law is great. You go to the law of Moses, don't do this, don't do that. All right, I got that one. Checklist. Yep, checklist. Oh, okay, no tattoos. I'm good. Yep, check that one. All right, I didn't have my bacon day. I don't like that one. I messed up on the bacon one right there. I'll have to work on that. Okay, oh, I, went to, I went to church, Sabbath. Yep, got it. You know, it's, the law is easy as, as far as, you know, you can see it. It's all laid out. Moses did a great job. Grace. Mm. Grace is a lot more complicated. Only in the sense of understanding it. Because we don't deserve it. Right? Grace is unmerited favor. You got favor and yet we're sinners. Until we come to Jesus. And then we're set free. We're saints. On the process of sainthood. But you know what I mean? Like, it, it makes it a confusing thing. So grace is hard because we say, okay, oh, well, I know, I, I know I'm not supposed to, to say something against my neighbor. Yet we do. And if, you know, and, and if we're not careful and we don't, keep the, if we don't keep on it, we realize, oh, okay, we're not do- battling sin in ourselves, and it starts to grow. And we start to say bad things about other people. I just use that one because it's a very common one that everybody struggles with. And so we need to understand that grace sets us free, but grace means that we have a large obligation that we wouldn't dare expose Jesus to the cross again and again and again and again by our actions. But we're saying, Jesus, you died once for me, and that's all it took. So I'm going to do everything I can to stay as close to you as possible so that I can not walk in the sinful ways of the past. And sin is in the past. The temptations will continue until you make, you make it to heaven in glory. And so then we know these, the, the, the last little part, you know, in verse 22, he says, now that you've been set free from sin, you're set free. You, you, you don't need to be reset free. The day you accepted Christ as your Lord and the Savior, you said, I repent of my sin, I, I, I repent of that, and I take up the new life. You are set free from sin. You say, but why am I still struggling with it? Because your flesh has a memory. Now, I've come to learn something. I've, I've got these, these nice braces on. I'm getting all fixed up. And, uh, and I, yes, I'm going through puberty at, you know, 20 years late. But whatever. <laughs> I come to learn about this from, from the doctors. You know, that your teeth, that they move them, and they turn them, and they twist them, and they pull them, and they do all these things. And it's amazing to see what they can do. And then I, get, I got the, the, the fun information from my, my orthodontist who said, oh, you know, you'll have to have a retainer after this. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Because your teeth have memory. There's little rubber bands in there, and, and they kind of attach to the bone, and wherever you move them, they, even 45 years later, they can move back. And so if you don't keep the retainers in place, they're going to get crooked again, and maybe not as bad, but then you're going to have to go get them fixed, or, or they're going to look all crooked, all that money you spent on it. And so um, sin is like that in our lives. It, it, it has a memory. It wants to kind of spin back to that where it's comfortable. But in Christ Jesus, we're set free from that, kind of like the braces pulling it out of, out of those bad positions, but we still got to maintain it. It's not that we're being saved any longer. The salvation has been purchased and bought and we're in it. But we got to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to spiritually drift away from the safety of the dock of Jesus. Because when the storms come along, it could sink your ship real quick. And so that's what he's talking about here. We've been set free from sin and we're slaves to God. Yet it isn't interesting that slavery to God is absolute, 100% unequivocal freedom. I don't know anybody who loves the Lord and feels that that slavery is any bit of a burden because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So put the yoke of Jesus on yourself. You know what a yoke is? Like they used to move horses and, and ox around to pull, pull things, big heavy harness around you. In Jesus, it weighs nothing because he took it on himself on Good Friday. 
and he took it to the tomb. But on Sunday morning, when that stone rolled open, that old yoke, it's left behind, and we get the yoke of Jesus, which is complete uh, ease because he's done the work for us. And so we're slaves to God, and we, we reap, as Paul says, you reap benefits. It leads to holiness. You notice you don't get the holiness right away? That one really irritates me. Coming to Jesus, accepting the Lord, being a, a believer. Why isn't holiness like right there? That's, that's the thing that gets me. I was like, God, I want to be holy now. And he's like, no, no, it's a process. But the process is so much work. But it's the most wonderful work because I know that I'm better than I was 10 years ago. And God willing, should he tarry and we, we're all here another 10 years from now, I would, I would choose to believe that probably 10 years from now I'm better than I am today and closer to him than I am today and less uh, affected by the sin traps of the flesh than I am today. And so he says, and he, he closes with this, he says, for the wages of sin is death. What does sin, what does sin buy for you? Death. When you go to work for sin, you will die. Your soul will die. Your life will often die. And at the very end of life, your eternity dies with it. But, and there's that but again, canceling that out, for those who are in Jesus, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus the Lord. Is there anybody here that wants to enjoy the gift of eternal life? I know I do. So how do you put sin to death in your life? Now that we understand that sin is, is, is a scoundrel, sin is, is diabolical, sin is powerful, but it has no power in Jesus. And when we have Jesus in us, it has no power in us unless we allow it to be there. So the number one is this, understand it's Jesus who frees us from sin. If you ever start thinking that you're going you're gonna to get free from sin because you're a good person, You've already lost the race. Forget that mindset. Discard that. Understand it's Jesus that frees us from sin. It's Jesus. Just, you just say it over and over. It's amazing. When you say it on, on repeat, it, sin doesn't seem to have the stigma that it had before. It doesn't seem to have the, the power it had before, the allure. And, and it, just, it just melts off. Because you understand, I get it. Jesus freed me. At the cross of Calvary, all of my evil, all of our evil was taken on his back, lashed to him, beaten to him. Uh, he, was, he was abused for our sins and put on that cross and nailed there. That sin nailed with him. And as that perfect, spotless blood of, of Christ came out of his body, it wiped away all those sins forever. We no longer have to be a slave to it. And so Jesus frees us from sin. John 8, 36 says, So, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. My, my question to this church today is, is there anybody who is free indeed? Yes, All right. That's what I like to hear. We are free indeed. You say, but I may struggle. If you're a little new to, to faith, you're going to struggle. And even when you've been long to faith, you're still going to have some days of struggle. And that's the, here's the term that I like to use. You're in a fight. And some days it feels like a hell of a fight, right? You feel like hell is coming at you. You're just like, it's a hell of a fight. But it's one awesome, good fight. Paul called it the fight of faith. So don't be, don't be upset when you're, you're going through those fights. You're, you're weeding your garden. You're getting things in, in order. And, and God has already set you free. And now you're starting to learn how to keep yourself in the right uh, area of faith. And that's what, what he's saying here. The sun sets you free, so you're free indeed. Jonathan Edwards the, the, the mid-century um, evangelist, scholar, he said, um, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. And that, that floors me when you think about it. You really contribute nothing to your salvation. There's nothing you can do. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't show up and just look good for it. There's, there's nothing you can do. You can't trade. This is nothing. You're stuck. You're lost. But you contribute nothing to the salvation except for the evil, the sin that made it necessary to be so. And, and Jesus freely offers it to us. Lovingly says, hey, I'll exchange it for you. Give me your sin. Give me your, your failings. Give me your evilness. And I'll give you my righteousness. And you'll be free. 
And that's what we have to understand. Jesus is the one that sets us free. Galatians 5, 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And sin is slavery. You're, you're a slave to whatever it masters you. And so we have to understand that we, we are set free from that. So we've got to stand firm. That doesn't mean that you're doing it in your strength. You're saying, I stand for, I believe in Christ. I believe in the word of God. I believe in the work of the cross. I believe that my Savior died. I believe that my Savior rose again. And I believe that I am free in Christ Jesus. And you have to, you have to get your, your heart into that understanding. So it is for freedom that we have been set free. Jesus frees us from sin. Number two, learn to embrace the new life that you have been given. Learn. It's, it's a learning process. There is nothing wrong with going to school. School is good. Education is good. Spiritual education is even better. Learn to embrace the new life that you've been given. Jesus has given you a new life. The old you is dead and gone. Though it still has some memory to it. I find it interesting that Scripture tells us very clearly that when you, when you give your, your life to Christ and you give your sin to Christ, it's forgotten as far as the east is from the west. God forgets our sin. We remember our sin, and the devil tries to remind us of our sin. So you just you tell the devil to take a hike. He has no power here. And you remind him of where he's going because of your Savior Jesus. And it is amazing how he will start to back off, and you will start to get stronger in Christ. Learn to embrace the new life you've been given. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, or look at it, the new has come. All I can see is new people here. For those who are in Christ Jesus, you're just, all I see is new people. We're new in Jesus. And what are his promises? They're new every morning. You're walking in the promises of Jesus, and they're new every morning. So if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old, the old you is gone, and the new has come. See, a new creation, we must begin to follow Jesus um, and let the Holy Spirit reshape our identity and our desires. That, and that's really what it comes down to. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to say, Holy Spirit, reshape me. Re, you know, make, make me the way you need to make me. And I know that I can't do it on my own. So I'm, I'm saying, take my life and, and make it what you've always planned it to be. Isn't it great to know that when you stumble on that process of growth, on that process of, of redemption, God doesn't turn his back on you. Scripture says, and we sang a song about faithfulness this morning, Scripture says that when we're faithless, he is faithful. God doesn't want to turn his back on you. He will only turn his back on the enemies of God who choose to not love him the way they, that he loves them. So don't worry that if you're not perfect today, there is not one perfect person in this building right now except the Holy Spirit who's in each one of us. And as I said, this building is only perfect Monday through Saturday. None of us are here. The, the perfection goes away when we all show up, but isn't it good to know that the, the perfect one is inside of us, living in our lives? And so yes, there's still perfection here in us. We're a new creation. So we need to in, embrace the new identity. Don't continue to live like the divas of the world. Don't continue to live like the angry people of the world. Don't continue to live like those who are trying to uh, do everything on their own. Live in Christ Jesus. Let the old die. Watchman Nee said, Our old history ends with the cross, and our new history begins with the resurrection. And that is so true. So remember, to learn to embrace the new life you've been given. You're not the old you, you're the new you. And then lastly, delete fleshy desires with godly habits. And I use the term very intentionally when I said delete. I love delete. When I'm typing things along and oops, made a mistake, doop, gone. Love it. The old days when we were on typewriters, you're like you know, white out and you're kind of trying to do that and you're like pull the paper out and start all over again. Nowadays you just hit delete, gone. So I use that word intentionally because it really is what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here. How do you put sin to death in your life? Delete fleshy desires. With what? Godly habits. So you're doing a godly habit this morning. You're here. That's a good godly habit. When you pull out your Bible during the week, that's a good godly habit. When you say to somebody, I forgive you, that's a good godly habit to practice. 
I'll be talking about forgiveness in the, in the spring because I think we're going to see spiritual breakthrough when we lock into forgiveness because that is one of the biggest things that people deal with, I think, in, in life. I think a lot of other sins are, are built on lack of forgiveness. And yet, what does our Savior do? Forgive us. So delete fleshy desires. Galatians 6, 8 says, whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh they're going to reap destruction. And whoever sows uh, to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Can I ask you this question? When you go out your, your daily business, are you thinking, how, how can I please God today? I challenge you this week, especially not when things are just easy, when things are starting to get a little heated in life, a little tense. Say, God, how, how can I please you here in this? How can I use my business? How can I use my, my job? How can I use that relationship to please you? Or even better yet, do this. When you're praying, when you're talking with the Lord, when you're singing songs of praise, say, God, how, how can I please you today? It, it, it's, think of it like your parents or your kids. It brings you joy to make them happy. So why don't you say to the Lord, God, how, how can I make you happy today? You'd be amazed at the, at the transformation. It, it's almost like it, it, it destroys. It's like, like an instant destroyer of, of sin and, and bad motives. When you start to say, God, how, how, how do I make you happy today? Not, God, what can I do to earn salvation? But God, how, how can I make you happy? How can I get to know you more today? What, what can I do to, to put a smile on your face? And we know that God looks at it like that because if you go back to the Old Testament, even before the, the time of grace, David was a man after God's own heart. Daniel was a friend of God. The Lord walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the afternoon. God is a relational God, and he longs for those kinds of conversations. I'll leave you with this. That last quote on my thing. On my note there. Thomas Fuller, another great man of God, said, let us stop the progress of sin in our soul at the first stage. For the further it goes, the faster it increases. And isn't it so true? It's a slippery slope. When we start to give in to, to sinful things, it's, it's amazing before long how we're doing a whole bunch of sinful things. And it's not death by one big cut, it's death by a thousand cuts, where all of a sudden one day we wake up and we're like, I don't know if I really believe God anymore. I don't know, God, you know, God doesn't really care. And you know, before long you're saying, I don't really care. You stop attending church and you just, you stop doing the things of, of the word and, and it's like you drift. And I use that analogy a lot, but your boat is meant to be moored to the shore that's safe. And sort of like we allow the, the ropes to slip and eventually they come un, unhinged from the dock or untied to the dock and it, the boat starts to drift away. So one day we wake up and we, we have no way of getting back. And the storm comes up and it crushes them. And nothing that makes me sadder to hear a believer who turns their back on the Lord and walks away from their faith. This is why you are responsible for you. God has called you. Protect your faith. Guard your faith. Because the cross and Good Friday is only good if we live and walk and believe in that good that was completed on Easter Sunday. And this coming week we'll talk about that, we'll celebrate that, and we'll remember that. Because we want to put sin to death in of ourselves the way Jesus put sin to death in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of your goodness. You're just so amazing, Lord. And God, I want to say it on behalf of this congregation. God, how can we make you happy today? How can we please you, Lord, today? How can we get to know you better today? How can we build our relationship better and closer with you today? And it's different for every one of us, but Lord God, that's what the cry of our heart should be, is that we want to move away from sin. The only way to do that is to move closer to you. We either move closer to our sin, or we move closer to our Savior. And God, we are choosing today to move closer to our Savior, so that we can continue to put sin to death in and of our mortal bodies, so that we can be slaves to Christ, where the yoke is easy and the burden is light. 
And so, Lord, for those that are struggling with this today, I ask God that today they would confess that to you freely and openly and that you would, you would bring freedom to that captive, Lord God, that they would no longer be slaves to those things, but they would be slaves to Christ, which means they're going to be free in Christ. Lord, help us to, to witness to our world. Help us to live in a way that shows them there is hope found in one name. It's the name above all names. It's the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. So God, I pray that you'd bless those that are here today. Go with them this week as they, as they work on this and they grow in this, that they put the sin to death and keep their spiritual gardens weeded. Because God, as we do that, we're going to produce a harvest, a fruitful harvest. We're going to get to know you better. and We're going to be closer to you and we're going to become better men and women of God on our journey to eternity. So Lord, I pray your blessings on each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we close in a final song? Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around. Mending hearts, you are here. Mending every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way.
you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't feel it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't feel it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I Light in the darkness, that, that is who you are. And you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing it one more time. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are, Lord. You are our way maker. You are the miracle worker. And so, Lord, today we give you glory. We give you honor, we give you praise because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You conquered death, hell, sin, and the grave to give us free and eternal, everlasting life in the name of Jesus. And so Lord, today for those that need it, I pray God that the freedom of Christ would become evident ever so strongly in their life. Lord God, they would confess the areas they need to confess and they would give up the things they need to give up because giving that up for you, Lord God, is not really giving up anything. It's really taking on something that only you can give us, the freedom and the love of God. And so, Father, I pray your blessing on each and every one that goes here today. Go with them this week. Make them a light in a dark place in this community and beyond. And, Lord God, be with each and every one of us, guiding us to safety. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, and all of God's people said, And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face continue to shine upon you and be gracious to you, church. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May all the promises of God be given unto you and your works be blessed. May the Lord give you long life and good days and may the Lord Jesus prosper you in all your ways that you may be a beacon of light and hope to the lost in Vernon and beyond. And may the fruit of faith, hope, and love be in the depths of your heart all the days of your life. And all of God's people said,
Amen. Have a wonderful week, church. May God bless you. For those of you that are voting members, please stay. Anybody wants to stay for the meeting, you may stay as well. Donuts are in the, in the lobby.